I was all good at first, and then when my my grandma got murdered, and then everything went downhill from there, and then most of my family was gang members already. So I said, oh yeah, I may as well join up with them, man. When I first came in, my charges were so serious, man. They were asking 15 years to life, another eight years on top. They wanted 23 years in total. First time in jail, no criminal record. I'm from being a gang member. I grew up in a gang lifestyle. I grew up like, when I was a little kid, looking up to these gang members, thinking, okay, I want to be just like that. Rob Pappen grew up in a street gang. The street was his home, and his family was his gang. Rob saw the dark reality of gang life from the inside, and knew he had to get out. Today, Rob Pappen is a family man, the father of five children. They are his new gang. They are who he represents. And today, Rob helps Aboriginal gang members and associates leave the gang. Leaving is easy, staying out is the hard part. He calls it gang intervention and prevention. We're back at square one. Having to start over, yeah, that's a motherfucker, man. But that's where the sacrifice is. Those are just material things. They come and go. Who's Roberto without that, though? Homeless. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm still me, like, without them. My kids are still going to be my kids without them. See, I've been trying to show you this all day. Okay, I, I, I got it. <laughs> I got it. I got it. <laughs> Aboriginal street gangs have become a serious problem in major cities and on reserves. Never witnessed gang activity so pronounced as I've, uh, I've seen it here in, uh, in, in the community that I'm in. And at su such a young age also, uh, we're seeing kids uh, as young as 9 and 10 as runners and, you know, as, as young as 13 doing drive-by shootings and, uh, and carrying weapons and, and so forth. Rob Pappen spends much of his time in Aboriginal communities talking to youth about the pressures they face to become involved in gangs. Go to class. How old were you when you got out of the gang? What's up, buddy? Is this your brother? He's my brother. He's 16, turning 16 today. And my other brother, Nathan, he's 14. And he's like interested in all that gang stuff. I and mean, he is wants he? to follow that path. Where is he? He's at home. That's why I said he should have been here. Rob has received countless phone calls from gang members yeah. over the six years he has been doing gang intervention work. I don't know if you'd call it destiny or luck or, you know, whatever went to class one day and I seen this poster on the wall it said gang violence help stop it there's a number at the bottom so I thought you know I'll check it out so Derek phoned me once twice three times finally I phoned back the fourth time I got to speak to Rob so I met him at this tattoo place in his neighborhood you know his, his gang neighborhood so I went and met him you know I went there as myself um, didn't try to play the role didn't try to play the tough guy role or you know, think I was better than anybody this winter as me. You know, I was looking for him to play this, you know, this solid role, this whatever. But, you know, at the same time I'm looking at him, I'm thinking this guy's only 20, you know, 22. We, we talked for a while and, you know, he took me to the place he works. And I guess you can say from that point, he kind of took me under his wing and um, started guiding me. Derek Powder grew up in Edmonton's inner city with an alcoholic mother and never knowing his father. I am a former gang member, so that makes me feel proud about As a part of the healing process, far, Rob time, encourages Derek to speak in public about his gang experiences. So there he is, you know, talking, first time public speaking. I love being a gang member, you know, at the time. You know, don't get this twisted or stereotype, not in the gang no more. What he doesn't realize is that I got him on the hook now. There's no way you can go out publicly in front of all of these professionals in a place like this and say, you're an ex-gang member and still try to be a gang member. 
The shame of growing up in poverty, surrounded by alcohol and violence, pushed Derek away from his family and onto the street. Rob Pappin has seen guys like Derek Powder come and go over the years. Some make it out of the gang, most don't. This was the community leave for the hood, man. This is where gang members came, the dealers, the drunks, the drug addicts, the people from the street, a place to just be themselves and, you know, it didn't matter who you were or what you were about or what kind of background you had, as long as you had money. Back in the day, if there was any outreach workers that came by to say, hey, Derek, um, do you need help? What would you have said? What the fuck are you trying to help me for? Mm -hmm. You know? My mentality back then, I think, you know, well, what do you want from me? What do I got to do for you, you know, for you to come and help me? Because people just don't walk up to you and say, hey, can I help you? Can I get you off the street? Because they sit there and they say, when I used to talk to counselors growing up, they'd sit there and say, you know, um, so how's everything, you know? How's this, how's that? Or don't drink, don't do drugs. Or what the fuck are you trying to tell me not to drink and do drugs for? Do they sit there and say, hey, what's going on in your home life? Or the community you live in, what do you see every day? Most gang members, why are they male? Because they don't have that father figure at home. So sitting there, 10 years old, you know, little brother sleeping. I'm supposed to be sleeping too, but I can't sleep because mom's not home. We're not home with anybody, actually. That was a hard thing to deal with. Having the mom take off <clears throat> and uh, not be there. So finally, eventually, you'd fall asleep, get up in the morning. Sometimes she'd be there, sometimes she wouldn't. When she was there, she wouldn't be up for, to, you know, get us ready for school or I guess cook us breakfast, so I'd, you know, slap something together for me and my little brother. Get my little brother dressed and away we went. We're in a big gym gymnasium like this, right? Say, I'm sitting over there with this group of my class. And this girl, she throws a piece of paper through the crowd. First person they target, me. I get hauled out of the gym, walk through those doors, say. This teacher walks up. As she's walking and I'm following her, she turns around, she says, you know what? She goes, it's a sad story about you. And I said, what's that? She goes, that you'll never amount to nothing. You're just another stupid Indian kid. You know, seeing my mom and my stepdad fight a lot, that's how they handled their problems, you know, by yelling, swearing, screaming at each other and physically assaulting each other. So I thought, okay, this is the way to deal with things. I enjoyed that, you know, being a tough guy. That's what I was called, the tough guy in the school, you know. I enjoyed that. Getting that, I guess, that title at a young age, it gave me power, you know, over people. Nobody would fuck with me, plain out and simple, man, you know. Talking to some of the kids, you know, I don't know how it would come about, but we'd sit there and some about welfare would come up. I wouldn't say mom was on welfare. Cause like, fuck, I was embarrassed, man. You know, where all these kids are saying, oh, my mom's got this job, my dad's got this job, and, you know, I ain't gonna say, well, you know what, my mom's on welfare and I don't have a dad. That was embarrassing for me. I don't say stuff like that because that reflected on me, you know, the way I dressed, how I presented myself at school. I was embarrassed, you know, to be who I was. I didn't want to sit there and say, well, I got my clothes from Valley Village or Bissell Center. You know, mom would say, let's go to the Bissell store. Fuck that shit, man, I ain't going there. But still, you know, I'd go, wear those clothes, go to school. You see all these kids wearing brand name clothes. Well, for me, I wasn't one of those kids. I really think that kids that decide to get into gangs nowadays, they should really, really think about what they're getting into. Every cop in the fucking, in the districts will know you, man. Gang unit will fucking roll up on you just for the hell of it because you're walking down the street and punch you out, man. Take you to the floodway, fucking leave you there walking back in the middle of winter time, man. Just fucking wearing your socks and that shit, man. So you don't need that shit, man. Just fucking go the right route, man. You know, fucking gang life's not the way to go, man. 
really, really understand what you're getting involved in. And that for some, there is no coming back. We place you on our national computer, CPIC, the Edmonton Police Service, if you're involved with gang activity or criminal activity, you're on that network. So when you get stopped anywhere, and that includes going across the border because uh, the U.S. Customs has access to this. So if they pick this up and you've been picked up for drugs, for example, and you're off to Disneyland, they may not let you come into their country. Yeah, I wanted to come to jail. I wanted to be the baddest. The baddest I can be. At first, I, like I said, I chose it because it, it seemed, it looked from a distance like it was, it was exciting, it was fun. But this time when I got out, they were starting a group and that, and even though I didn't want to be a part of it and that, I'd go and see them and that. Because I'd never stop them being my friends. They were my friends, my brothers, and people I loved and who were always seemed there for me when I was out. When they were growing up, they were angels. They were good kids. Like I never went through a hard time or nothing. They just went to school, came home. Everything was neat. It was cool. And then when I put it together with now, like, what happened? Where's, where's my good kids? I, 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 get away from you as fast as I, could. You there to make I got all mine from movies, man. Like when I found that blood and blood out man, on the street, we were walking back to my buddy's house. We seen a videotape in the alley and I grabbed it. It said blood and blood out. We didn't know what the hell it was, eh? Went home, washed it, fuck, straight gangster, man. It was like, awesome, man. Just, that's it, that's right there, man. Like, Cause they went right up the line, poof. Like me, go to fucking in the movie there, man. Went straight to the top, man. You know how you, when you play, say, say, when you, when you play a part of a role in a movie or something, you play that character, you are that character. I had to transform myself into him. And I had to be that character. To full out to extremes, I had to go all the way in what I was doing. We started this one, one click, we started this up, and then uh, it was called uh, Independent Gangsters, were IG. There was just six of us. Quentin Tompkins, or Q, Derek, and Quentin's two brothers, Cecil and Flary, joined the same gang in the late 1990s. And we started getting a name for us, ourselves, and uh, we, got, we got a call from these other guys that we knew. You know, they had their own clique going on, but they switched over to something else, and uh, we went over there, and they were drinking, and they asked my buddy, you know, you want to be part of our crew? And he said, the only way I'll become part of it is if you let my brother and my other brother in. You know, and that was like a dream come true, man. You know, that's where it began. I always knew till they told us, eh? Mm-hmm. They told us that they were joining a, a gang members, everything. And we tried to stop them, to tell them, no, it's not, not a good life to be in, but they, they figured they, they were old enough to make their own decision. My parents always had the right mind to tell me what to do, but I never did listen to them as in growing up in a gang, and I just chose that way. Gang life is all about proving yourself and being solid. So there are different ways to recruit new members for the gang. In this case, the wannabe gang member is about to experience a jumping in beating to prove he can take his licks like a man. He is lured to a remote area and then jumped in by the patched members. Sometimes these recruits end up in hospital as a result of the severe beatings. In this case, the wannabe did not make it into the gang because he was beaten to death. For me to get into the gang lifestyle, I wanted to be in power. I wanted that control over people. I wanted to have respect and inflict fear on people and I wanted people to back my play. I'm gonna do something right now. I'm gonna ask you guys something. I need everybody's shoes. Everybody that's wearing shoes, well obviously all of you. <laughs> 
Yeah. Everybody throw their shoes in the middle. Yeah. Both sides, both pair, both just, shoes. Just throw them in there. Just throw them Nobody in Nobody hit me. <laughs> You've seen one person throw their shoes, so why not? You know, the whole crowd goes, just like the gang, you know? And then we explain to them the reality of it. That's how it is. Now I have your property. I want to see how tough you are. I want to see if you challenge me. Got some nice shoes. Can we get you guys now to throw all your the ones wearing jackets into the in the middle too? Bring your jackets. Don't worry, it won't go any farther than that. How did you guys feel about throwing your stuff in the the middle? It's getting boxed around. <laughs> what was that? Oh, I understand. I said, it's felt like it's getting bossed around. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> How did you feel? Oh, you didn't throw your stuff Hey, you're still wearing shoes, man. How did you feel? Hey. It didn't matter to you? <laughs> you know why I did that? See for donkeys? Huh? See for donkeys? <laughs> what, what's a donkey? I don't know. You whip him, tell him to move, he moves. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> you want to use that term? You know, you guys noticed I was sitting in the back there, right? You guys didn't see me at all? I saw you. Well, you guys didn't see me in the front. You saw me, you know, in the back, right? And you saw me come up here and ask Derek to tell you guys to throw your stuff up here, right? Do you see how I punked you guys out? You guys didn't even In know your it. own community, in front of your own friends? I did show you something. Your shoes and your jacket are over there. That's showing you something, okay? But how much influence we have over you guys. Now for the guys that stood up and said they were leaders, why are they sitting up here now? Leaders would stay, just stay put and do their own thing like they were saying, right? Like I do my own thing, right? Sorry. I do my own thing. But yet they're up here and I asked them to do my own thing. Okay? You guys got pumped. <laughs> and you're on TV. <laughs> As I was getting older, I started realizing that I liked it and I wanted to stay in it because I had respect. People never badmouthed me. They never talked bad to me. You know, if I raised a finger, somebody would jump. I. I like power. Uh, there's uh, three kids. I call them kids. They were 16, 18, 19 year old. They've been out drinking. It's 2.30 in the morning. And the 16 year old asked a group of kids uh, just for a cigarette. One of these kids from that group reaches out and hits this guy on the face where he's just had a little bit of an operation. And all these kids then in that group just go running off. This guy thinks they're a group called the Red Alert. So he goes back to his apartment, basement suite, gets a knife, gets a hockey stick, baseball bat with his two buddies. They go to a fourplex where they think this group is and they kick in the door. And he's yelling their, that group's name, but he's hit an Indian posse house. The lady that's there comes out. Neighbors come out, they come out armed because they know they want to protect their property. They know who lives in that suite, so they want to be prepared. The young guy, the 16-year-old, and one of the neighbors, who's only 19 or 20 himself, get into an argument. They both have knives. They stab each other. The 19-year-old starts chasing the 16-year-old. He's had his aorta cut, nicked. It's the main artery to the heart. By one time around the block, he's bled himself to death and he dies. 16-year-old's arrested, charged and convicted of manslaughter, and goes to prison. You have two families and relatives and a great number of people that cared for both of these people, now adversely affected because something stupid like that. <laughs> I'm using the weight to let that aggression go, that um, anger 
If I don't take it out on the weights or the punching bag, I'm going to take it out on somebody eventually. And this is another healthy form, you know, showing Derek that there's other ways to release that aggression. Me and Derek always use it. You can take a person off the street, but you can't take the street out of the person. So that's just me saying, hey, fuck you guys, but, you know, I'm using the weight, you know, to say it. A lot of gang members are very angry and being like a gang member's girlfriend, you carry a lot of their anger, like physically, emotionally. Gang members used to come stay with me there, come, you know, buy drugs or whatever, come get high, and when my daughter wasn't there. Yeah, the one right at the, the far corner. Yeah. People would just go in the back stairs, come knock at the window, and you just slide open a little sliding door, you know, make transactions and stuff. And There is no women in the group, but there is a bunch of women who hang around the guys. And I'll tell you straight up, they say you're nothing but a mattress. In a gang, you have to satisfy your man. And if he turns around and he tells you he wants you to sleep with another woman, you're going to have to or else he'll beat the living crap out of you, you know. Or if he wants you to turn around and, and go sleep with his buddy because his buddy doesn't have a girlfriend, you know, you're going to have to do that. When a girl's in a bathroom, when you're there, you're at a party and it has to do with drugs, different guys are going in and out of there. Everybody knows what she's doing. Everybody around knows what's going on in that bathroom. And it's all just for, you know, a few minutes of separation, basically, like from their mind, from the drugs. And yet their bodies are just getting used for nothing. In a gang, women are nothing but a doll, piece of meat, um, somebody to be able to turn around and say, hey, you know, she's there. I'll go fuck her. Then I'll go fuck that other girl in about an hour. You know, it's a hard life. It's a very hard life. There is no you know, beautiful high-rise that you live in. There is no, you know, all beautiful clothes that you wear. Nobody has their own space. Nobody has their own personal belongings. It's just a crappy place with crappy stuff. There's a lot of girls now that they don't understand what they're getting into. They just see it as oh, well, my boyfriend's, you know, this, and he can give me this or buy me that, and, you know, I don't have to pay for drugs, or, you know, I could just go to a party and everything will just be all fun and games. It's not like that. It's not like that at all. What does he give you? He gives me money here and there. He comes down here and gets me buys me licks, well, food. And when we were drinking at a couple of parties, he was like giving me drugs, but I told him I don't smoke them, so if I have a girlfriend with me, I'll like give them to her and she'll smoke them. Mm -hmm. so That's why I'm asking him. Would he like try and put her on the street, make, like, try and make her pay her back for that? Like every time I see him, he's with like 20 guys. Why does he have to have 20 guys with him? You shouldn't find him, he's a short little dude. Huh? He's like real short. <laughs> he's like one of the smallest and he's like calling all the shots. To who? To all those like runners. To all those, all those older, bigger guys. So why you want to get a record? No, but... You are going to get a record. Let's say you're at home and he's at your place. Boom, there goes the door. Cops come running in. 
even though the shit's not yours, are you gonna rat on him? Or are you gonna go down for that? Like, you, you can't just lead your own life, man. You know, you gotta worry about what's going on in your life, what's going on in every, your friend's life, you know, what's going on in this person's life, you know, what's happening within the crew, you know, what's happening with the guys inside. Catch them by themselves, they're soft, man, just like butter, man. They ain't nothing, man. They're so solid, man. They'd be rolling by themselves. That's the way I seen it. I seen a bunch of guys hiding behind the gang. But being a gang member is nothing. Just the bottom line is nothing. You're in a gutter, you have nowhere to go. It's the same as taking you and dropping you in a hole. Okay, get yourself out of this 12-foot hole. Rob is enjoying a visit with his cousin, Robert Wenger. Robert is the leader of an Aboriginal street gang and has spent the last eight years of his life in a maximum security prison. If you're smart while you're here, you really look at yourself and ask yourself why you are here. Over the years, I used to go to prison. All I'd think about while I was in was, can't wait to get out. I wonder what they're doing. I wonder what wonder who's all there, I wonder what that girl's doing, this girl. And never once did I ever stop to think about, why are you here, Rob? Like, why are you here? And you know, sitting there, you know, talking on the phone, you know, talking to my mom, she's crying, my dad, they're crying, you know. I tell them, and my lawyer told me, you know, they're asking, you know, they're asking 15 years. Look at my little brother, man. Young age, man. I brought him in at 15 years old. Made him do some heavy shit too sometimes. Now look at him, man. What a big brother I was, eh? And he's like, if you found guilty, they're gonna try to give you 25 years now. You know? I sat there, you know? I don't know what to say, man. You no, know, this is, what, two hours before my trial starts. You know? I told him, do what you gotta do, man. I said, I can't be sitting here for 25 years, man. I can't handle that, man. It's stressful, like, thinking of it, you know? When are I going to see my guys? Like, when are they going to come out? When are they coming home? Being inside jail and fucking asking people to help me out, get me out because I got bail. But sitting in there, oh, yeah, they'll say, yeah, we'll be there. We'll come get you. We'll get you out. What do you need? You need money? Fuck, we'll hook you up. Yeah, well, fucking one week, two weeks, a month later, six months later, my ass is still fucking and sitting in there. No money, no bail. And people are asking me that I ain't part of the gang. Why the fuck are you in a gang if they can't even take care of you? Man, you got, you know, all these guys saying they're your bros. You go up with them. Look, they turn on you like that, man. Call you a rat, a skinner, a check off, a piece of shit. And yet they ain't got no paperwork on you, man. They ain't got nothing. Just, I don't know. Those what you call the has beens not even. There never was, man. They never made the food chain like me, man. They never will, you know? There's no loyalty. My face was supposed to get slashed. I was supposed to get stabbed up and... And this is supposed to be from people that I grew up with. My friends. Like, I was a, I was a one committed gang member, man. Like. I put my gang before my girlfriend, man. Shit, now I don't even have a girlfriend now, fuck. Gang member, that's who I was, that what I was fucking 24 seven, man. I lived it and I breathed it. I lost the one woman I loved through this gang. She always wanted me to leave the gang, quit selling drugs, do this, go to work, straighten out. But I, I always told her, I'm a gang member till death. Death do me part, I said, I represent till I die. You know, I chose this gang over my own daughter. My daughter's four years old, just turned four in September. Four years old, and you know what? Four years she's been alive, and I bet you, in her whole lifetime, I haven't even spent six months with her to a year.
Rob has been teaching Derek about family values and how they are a part of a healthy lifestyle. Feeling more confident that he can leave the gang life behind, Derek has recently decided to regain custody of his four-year-old daughter. Rob accompanies him to his first appearance in family court. You think people are your friends because they're there, they back you up. Nobody's really there for you and back you up except for your family. And that's your family. With family, the individual and the family and the family themselves sacrifice a lot to help each other. In the gang, you're always sacrificing to the gang, giving up your freedom and your choices and uh, a lifestyle. And when I ask a lot of these guys, especially the younger ones, why did you join a gang? Oh, there's too many rules at home. But when they start and stop and think about it, there's just as many rules in the gang. But your mom may not take a knife to you or beat you up or have you beaten up because you didn't clean your room. I just can't figure it out. You don't listen to your parents. Why do you have to go listen to somebody else that he never raised you to tell you to go do this and go do that and you go ahead and do it and you don't listen to your parents, you know? It just, it just don't make sense at all. I can say I was kind of, you know, even more self-doubt. She had all these fucking people in her corner back in her plate. And it was me and Rob standing there. You know, and I was nervous, like, fuck, man. You know, all these people are back in her play, and, you know, she's got a lot of weight. I said, don't look, these are just people, you know. They're paid. They're paid to be with her. And I said, I'm not paid to be with you. I said, that's a different. I said, I'm, I'm riding this out with you just to show you. I said, but if you do it, there is no turning back. My daughter's mother telling me, you know, they ain't going to give you your daughter. You weren't there for four years the whole time of her life. You didn't give her anything or provide for her. And you um, certainly didn't raise her. She doesn't even know who you are. The stress of going to court and dealing with complex legal matters has given Derek a craving for a taste of his old lifestyle. He is tempted to kick back a bit and ease the tension with a few drinks. Three hours, you know, debating whether or not it'd be cool for him to go have a social drink. And I was like, you know, there is no such fucking term as social drink when you're an alcoholic guy. Yeah, but alcoholics are only old and blah, blah, blah. I said, well, you know, I sobered up when I was 19, despite me being a dry drunk, I still knew I couldn't fucking touch alcohol, man. Well, you know, he tried to give me every lame ass excuse, and I was just like, boing, you know, like, give me a break, man. And he got mad. He was pouting. I don't know. And I was like, you know, long story short, you know, you go do what you got to do. If that's your case, that's your choice, cool. But just understand this is that when you phone me up tomorrow, let me know how you feel or everything like that, ain't nobody going to be picking up because I don't give a fuck. Derek fought off the temptation to drink, and his healing journey continues. Rob Pappin and Elder Joe Cottrell have been helping Derek to reconnect with himself as an Aboriginal person. On this day, Derek has returned to his cultural roots and to the spiritual traditions of the Cree Nation as he prepares for a sweat on the Alexander First Nation north of Edmonton. I know Derek. He got away from that gang talk, see? He made up his mind. He was searching for him some way to get out of there. And he found it. He's got that respect now, eh? That's why everything is going right for him, huh? He's happy now, eh? So he's stronger now, getting stronger, stronger. 100 years of residential schools 
where Aboriginal children were removed from their families, has created a state of despair and powerlessness for some people. Gangs create a sense of power for those who feel powerless and hope for those who live with hopelessness. I think that um, the uh, issue of residential schools and um, other social policies, and one of the profound social policies was outlawing ceremonies. <clears throat> I don't think that the residential schools alone, without the outlawing the ceremonies, because ceremonies provided for us a sense of identity, a sense of belonging. We even had our own justice system in the ceremonies. We had uh, ritual, and we had a sense of community. And the, the difficulty is that when that's pulled out and the, what they were trying to put in was unsuccessful in, in instilling the new values that they wanted to, all of those things that were pulled out over a hundred years happen and manifest in gangs. A sense of ritual, a sense of ceremony, a sense of justice. Maybe it's not justice that <coughs> mainstream would see as being justice, but it's their justice. If you believe, really honestly believe in who you are as a Native person, you can do a, a lot of magic. So I grew up like lost identity. I really didn't know who I was. And throughout all the years, I wasn't fortunate enough to learn about culture when I was younger. We have a, a young population, a young uh, marginalized group of young people that uh, are no longer uh, in a lot of ways connected with their culture, their language. Um, they don't have that sense of identity, that sense of belonging, that pride in, in who they are, um, that pride in their family. Like he's saying, like, our Aboriginal people, we've been struggling for years. We've been struggling for years, like, back in the day, fighting extinction, identity, to lay years later, we're fighting addictions. Nowadays, we're fighting each other. I know a couple of girls who've gotten, they've had certain marks on them, tattoos. They had them cut off by other people, like their skin cut right off. And I plan to get some of the tattoos on, some of these removals done, but by professionals. The gang tattoo, or patch, has been a big part of Derek's life for years. It was his badge of honor and a symbol of his loyalty to the gang. Now, Derek is getting it removed, patching it over with the image of an ego. This is but another step along the path of leaving the gang life behind. If you're with one of them, you gotta be on guard all the time because there's always enemies. Like with my daughter, before I had uh, my younger kids, we were house invaded. My girl was about maybe four or five. She was awake, she was sitting at her desk coloring and at the time my boyfriend, he was like sleeping on the couch. Our door got kicked in while we were sleeping. She came into the room and she was like screaming and she woke me up and I didn't know what was going on. She was terrified and she jumped in the closet underneath our clothes. She was hiding and then I went out and my boyfriend was getting like attacked by like four or five different guys with uh, clubs, baseball, baseball bat, golf clubs. You know, he was cornered, he wasn't doing anything. I don't even know where like the strength came from but I started swinging back at these people. Like I was scared. And I know my daughter was like, but my reaction was to defend myself. When people would knock at the door after that, she would like hide. It was just a natural reaction for her. She would like kind of duck down by the couch or something. And I'd look at her and, and inside my heart, like I'd just like, 
kind of fall apart inside. My friend was telling me how it affected her on when she was home invaded. She said, like, how can you do that? Like, how could they do that? Like, did they not think about, like, who else was there and care? I believe that's how she worded it. I told her, yeah. Of course they thought about it. That's why they did it. That's why I did it. That's part of the things of a group. One of them is intimidation. There's only two alternatives to this lifestyle. And that's death, or that's life in prison. Whoever says elsewise, well, you're kidding yourself. There was a guy in the hospital when I was in the hospital after I got stopped after I got stopped, who came in and died. And the same guys that, that, that after I got stopped, the same guys that stopped me went and stopped him. And all I knew is that I was being hunted too. So instead of having somebody drive around looking for me with a gun, I went and got my own gun. And instead of driving around, I went right to their place and I kicked it in. I didn't have a regard for who was in there. My only mission was to kill him. I've lost a lot of family members to the gang life, and I still am. I've lost two brothers and three cousins. And they had to get hauled away in a body bag. It wasn't just walking away, it was being hauled away in a body bag. They almost killed me once. They almost killed me twice. They almost killed me three times. I got chopped in the head with a samurai sword. My, my life almost got taken. I, I stabbed that one guy at least 11, 12 times, I don't know how many times. All I was thinking is he's gonna kill me, so I'm gonna kill him first. The negatives is getting slashed from ear to ear and getting cut on the arm, getting slashed in the face and having my lung pun punctured. I was in the hospital for six days, 50-50 chance to live. I died three times on that bed. I heard my own heart flatline. I heard beep. And I was, I seen myself. I floated up, I looked down at myself. And then all of a sudden, it went black. No matter what you go through growing up, what choices you make when you're younger and stuff, even if they are wrong ones, that you can still lift yourself up and go in a better direction. Man, when I go home, man, it's just gonna be like being born again, man. Whole new person. I don't know if I'm gonna hold it up in the city anymore. I'll probably move somewhere else, man. Start up somewhere different, new life, man. I'll go back and Start all over again, man. Lead a different way, man. It's just not the place to go, man. I got bad wounds. I can't even breathe right to this day from all my stab wounds, fuck. I had no sense of belonging. I had no role models. My kids have role models. And I hope to God that they have a sense of belonging. I had to lie to get into this program because really didn't know where else I would go. Um, started hanging around peop positive people, people that didn't use the drugs and the alcohol. Um, one of the first things that was told to me by my facilitator was what you put into the program is what you're going to get out of it. So I thought to myself, if I can be loyal to a gang for 10 years, I can start being loyal to me. Me today, I'm Robert Wenger. I'm me. I'm not outlaw anymore. I'm one who cares about my family. One who wants to spend time with my family. One who wants to tell my family that I love them. 
that I always have. I just didn't know how to say it. With Rob's help, and after many attempts, the courts have awarded Derek custody of his daughter. You're big and I need to get a shirt that fits you. Good. When she first walked in the door, when, you know, the day I got custody of her and she got dropped off that evening, you know, she walked through the door and, you know, here's this little person coming in my home, you know, and I look down at her and she got her little bag and she looks up at me and I was like, hey, how you doing? She goes, good. Like, you know, I'm standing there thinking in the back of my head, like, what the fuck do we do now? Cool. Take a shower. Not yet. Come on. Let's go. She knows how to count to ten in Cree. She knows how to say her ABCs. Right. You know, and sometimes she'll sit there. Like one day I was getting her ready for school. You know, and I put on some cologne and you know, I'm doing up her jacket and she goes, Mmm, mm, Daddy, you that. smell good. I was like, Thank you, my girl. And she goes, Yeah, Daddy, you smell like a gangster. I didn't go to sleep right away and, you know, looking at her and saying, holy shit, you know, here's my daughter. I put my arm around her and I gave her a kiss on the forehead, you know, and I don't know, it just, I don't know how to explain it, you know, it was just something I never felt before, you know. <laughs> 